everybody. So today we are going to part two of this case with Snowden versus the NSA. So on Tuesday we watched the movie, which was portraying Snowden as an absolute hero for his actions. He mm -hmm. had a decision of conscience. He believed that what he was seeing was illegal, and his bosses wouldn't answer him, wouldn't pay attention to him. He thought that the laws were unconstitutional, and he was worried about the public's interest. So he didn't take any money for his actions, and he put himself at great personal risk. In the end, he created an environment where the discussion was public rather than private, and ultimately changed the policy of the United States, even though he did things that were illegal. So he's living in Russia today and still wanted by the government for his actions. So, members of the jury today, we are going to hear side two of the story. We have brought with us an expert witness. Scott McRae works here at GCU as a professor in mm -hmm. cybersecurity. And I have prepared for him uh, eight questions that I would think we have elaborate answers on. And so I'm going to ask the question, you're going to answer it, and then Anyone in the room can feel free to have a follow-up and try to poke holes in this guy's arguments, or at least clarify what he has to say. You agree to that? I agree to that. Okay. That's fine. So number one is pretty easy. It's an introduction. It says here, please tell us about yourself and your experience as it relates to this case with Snowden and the NSA. What is the nature of your work huh? and why would you be considered an expert witness? Well, my goodness, uh, it starts a long time ago. Before GCU, I spent something on the order of 30 years working on programs that were associated with the intelligence community. There are 15 agencies associated with the intelligence community, and they're under the control of the Director of National Intelligence. I worked on CIA, NSA, NRO, DIA, Air Force Intelligence, Army Intelligence, Marine Corps Surveillance and Intelligence, and uh, other programs under other agencies as well. Um, at my last level, I had a security clearance similar to Edward Snowden's, and that is a top secret SCI, SITK, Bravo, Gamma, SAP, SAR, Special Access, code word, 5i, eyes only, security clearance. Every time you go up a notch, you stick your little hand up in the air and you promise not to divulge what you're going to learn about because it can have grave consequences to the security of the United States. We put people's lives on the line. We fed information to um, operatives and in the agency there are analysts, the computer people who figure out information, and there are agents who execute programs, and there are operatives, those are the people deployed out in the field. And they are the people on the ground using the intelligence that we gather to do their jobs. They're, they are the ones whose lives are on the line every day. And so having worked on programs uh, for 30 years, within the agencies, I know the structure pretty well. Okay, let's move on to the second question, which you're already alluding to, is the code of conduct. Mm -hmm. So how should an intelligence agency employee handle information or policies that are morally questionable or personally repugnant that you feel a re, you know, you're not personally comfortable with dealing with? And so, how would you describe Snowden's position and how did it relate to your work and how does that make us feel about Snowden's job? Well, Snowden was doing a job that a lot of us do. He went through a semi-normal course. He went to a community college and he got certified and became a computer security expert and went uh, into the agency to do that, that kind of work. Anytime you're working on a highly classified program, you are looking at things that are, by their nature, going to be disturbing. You can't unsee some of the things that are going on in the world, some of the things that we do, some of the things that are happening to us. So there are programs within every classified program to deal with, I think something is wrong here. 
Okay. A lot of folks don't know that when you're working on a program of that nature, you can make an appointment with your congressman and you can schedule a meeting with your congressman. You ought to go through program management. You ought to go through agency management. You ought to go through program control. But you can go directly to Congress. And there is a place within the halls of Congress. It's a sensitive, compartmented information facility, a SCIF. And you have to have those very high clearances simply to walk through the door. But I can go into Congress and request a meeting with my congressman or a congressman that has a comparable security clearance. And I can go into the SCIF and I can talk to them in any level of detail and I can express my feelings about what's going on. Okay? I am protected by the whistleblower law. I'm not violating co confidentiality. I'm not exposing sources and methods. I'm not exposing operatives. I'm not outing anybody who's under the protection of the classified program. I'm speaking directly to my avenue to speak to the public because Congress represents us, whether they want to or not. Okay? We get to talk to Congress. If I don't have relief through Congress because they're trying to get reelected or they've got something else they're worrying about, I can go to the Director of uh, National Security. Okay? I can go to the DNI. I can go to the Justice Department and I can speak to these people to my heart's content. And that is my avenue for explaining, this is what we are doing, this is why I think it's wrong. And they can present, here's where it came from, not the public side, the Patriot Act, but the classified side. This is exactly why we're doing this and this is the source of that law. This is why this became necessary. And from there, I can work with Congress, I can work with the legislature, I can work with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, but I have avenues to work out my issues with any program without having to divulge classified information directly to the people who we are trying to keep from knowing what we're doing and how we're doing it. So personally, did you have any kind of uh, situation where you saw things that you personally didn't like, but you did because it was your job? I used to launch B-52 bombers. And it was an awkward situation because we were launching B-52 bombers and bombing uh, Cambodia and Laos. And we didn't know why we were bombing Cambodia and Laos. The Vietnam War was technically over. And we were continuing to run sorties day in and day out and bomb Cambodia. Okay, that was wrong. Those were the innocent people. We were supposed to be protecting these people. And it was wrong, it was wrong, it was wrong. So I went up to the commanding officer of the 916, no, not the 916, the 43rd Combat Group, and I said, sir, why are we bombing innocent Cambodian villages? And he closed the door and he said, we're not. We are trying to stop the Khmer Rouge under Pol Pot and they are committing genocide throughout Vietnam, Cambodia and Laos. They are intent on eradicating those populations and that's what we're trying to stop and ultimately they did. So yeah, I felt bad. Why are we bombing these people? This is the war is over. What are we doing? Got the classified briefing with the guy who was in charge, 06 Colonel, and he said, Pol Pot. Uh, and then he showed me pictures of Pol Pot's little command center. And it was about twice the size of this room, the entryway to it, covered with the skulls of the people that they had killed and they had heads on spikes and so forth. Uh, so that's what that particular series of missions was going after. Okay. We don't always know exactly why things are happening the way they're happening. But we practitioners, we people doing this job, have the right and we do it to go up and talk to, start at the program manager, then the program director, then the agency director for that sector. Okay. I talked to an NSA chief who owned half the globe. Nobody owns the whole thing. He had half the globe for the NSA. Phil Taylor and his wife Carol, who was the software development chief for NSA. 
and we could talk about anything we wanted to. You have access to these people. When you out information like this, tens of thousands of documents that are highly classified, S, I, T, K, Bravo, Gamma, SAP, SAR, EYES, those documents are protecting people. The primary thing they're protecting is sources and methods. That's why they're under control of the Espionage Act of 1917. Okay? The Espionage Act of 1917 governs distribution of classified information and penalties for doing that. Ten years in prison, lose everything you got, that sort of thing. Okay? We have access to the people who can actually give us answers. When you are absolutely sure that what is going on, this program is bad, you can, number one, let the government know that, Director of National Intelligence, you can speak to them face to face. You can walk off a program and say, I can't do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. You can go to your congressman with all of your classified files. Well, you're not supposed to take them out, but you can bring the congressman in. You can show them the information because they have access and go, this is wrong for these reasons. And then Congress has to act on that. Congress has to make an unclassified record of what they do. How come? Because everything Congress is doing is controlled by and paid for using public funds. Therefore, the American people have access to the basic information. They won't have access to the classified information, but you can make it known that you have raised an objection based on your moral compass about a particular program, a particular set of events that are taking place, the Snowden stuff, and you can get it on the public record. You then point to the public record, the unclassified components, and you can raise the flag as high as you want. You can point and scream and beat a drum and start a fire and march on Washington. You can do that without violating your oath. Now, Would, another follow-up to oh. that. I think you started to allude to this. It mm. says, uh, here, explain to us the consequences. Uh, you know, what's the fallout from a decision to share information to the public or to the His consequences are trivial by comparison. He is a traitor. Uh, he violated hundreds of oaths. How about and the consequences that his actions occur on other people? Well, imagine... Imagine you learning that the guy down the street is in the witness protection program and he puts some crime bosses in New Jersey in jail. Testimony to the grand jury. The crime bosses went to jail for life. Murder, extortion, fraud, racketeering, RICO charges. They went to jail. 30 people went to jail because this guy's testimony. Government puts him in witness protection. New names, new identities, new location, new jobs. Leave your life behind. It's a brand new start. Here is your history. This is who your family is and where they came from. Good luck. You learn about that. And you say, wait, that's not fair. That's not right. The public has the right to know that these crime people are living in the neighborhood. I'm taking out a half-page ad in the newspaper, and I'm going to out these people. Those people are going to die. But you felt you had the moral obligation to out these witness protection people. When you're talking about classified information, you are using sources and methods. Orbiting pieces that are taking pictures, flying pieces, things that, uh, that are under the sea, things that are floating on the sea. You know how intelligence is being gathered. Remember, we deliver this information to operatives, agents who are actually in the field, actually in China, actually in Russia, actually in North Korea, actually in Pakistan, Iraq, India. These people are located all over the world. They are operating under assumed identities. Okay. Their families are protected and somebody leaks the classified information about what they're doing and why. The operative is lost, his family is exposed, he is exposed or dead. The fallout is profound. 
people lose their positions, people lose their lives because somebody said, what we're doing is wrong and I'm going to deliver this class, highly classified information to the news media so that the people will know. Well, when the people know, so do the bad guys. And that's when they take them into the little white van and start removing fingers and things. They actually do. For real, they do. Okay, so the fallout is profound. There's a financial impact too. If you put a few billion dollars into establishing a program, somebody divulges the classified information, the program will in all likelihood be severely altered or it'll go away. So there's a financial loss, a billion here, a billion there. Eventually it adds up to real money. Okay. You take a, a network of orbiting satellites that are doing a particular job and make them useless because somebody divulged the encryption keys. So now the information is worthless. What's the impact of that? Okay, it's deep, deep impact. You've already talked about that you have avenues of uh, expressing your concerns. So Snowden said he took his case and his information to professional journalists, okay? He didn't just say... It's an oxymoron. I am going to... I'm not going... I'm going to send this to WikiLeaks. What he did instead, he says, I want to take professional journalists who will then run it past the White House mm -hmm. and say, is there anything in here that we are going to say and publish mm -hmm. that will actually compromise anyone's life or put them in danger? And he says, I did not just recklessly release this information. I released information so that the public would know about information, not specifics on agents, but on the general knowledge of the program. So what problems do you see with this approach? In, the, uh, in, in a very long past, I haven't found a reporter or news person whose word is worth anything. Second of all, what's their clearance level? What oath did they take? What access have they been granted? What promise have they made to the people who are doing this job? None. Okay. These are the very people that we swear not to give information to. News, uh, in news reporter, journalists, who are going to filter and organize the data, where is the insurance in that? The only skin they have in the game is increasing circulation, making their name bigger in the media, becoming more important, generating income for their, for their news agency. That's their priority. Their priority is not protecting guys driving tanks in Iraq. That's not their thing. Yeah. If, the, if the tanks get blown up, they have another news story. They have a counter argument mm -hmm. that a free press is the only sure counterbalance to an abusive government. A free press, and this is why my dad got out of the uh, news business. He was an editor of a newspaper. My grandfather was the editor of a newspaper. My great-grandfather was the editor of the newspaper. And my dad left because freedom of the press was intended to be responsibly administered by responsible citizen journalists. And we have gotten away from that. A journalist will now divulge anything to anybody if it will make a bigger story. And that's why my dad got out. He says, we have gone from journalism to what we used to call yellow journalism. The press is in place to keep the government in check. It is the public's eyes into the operation of the government. If anybody has watched the news lately, you may have noticed a wee bit of bias. Okay. Some information is being presented very, very skewed or very narrowly reported while ignoring other components. Doesn't matter which side you're on. Okay. The reporting has become sensational. We don't have news reporting nearly as much anymore as we used to. We now have opinion news. It's presented as the evening news, but it's not. Sean Hannity presents a very narrowly focused conservative side. 
and there are vast pieces of news that don't get reported. MSNBC, I don't remember, I don't know who all these people are, people watch this stuff. Um, they present supposedly the same information, vastly twisted to be the exact opposite. So we aren't actually seeing news. The news agencies aren't doing a service. They are twisting news. They are making them op-eds, okay? opinion editorials. And that's what we are getting. And when you hand tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of classified documents from sources and methods intelligence to the news people, I don't care what they say, personally, my opinion, I don't care what they say, they are going to use that information to further their career, improve their agency's profile, and increase their viewership or circulation for that narrow moment in time. That's their job. That's what they're going to do. Do I trust them? Not a bit. So you've already said that there are very clear ways that you can go to your government. So Snowden, in his uh, presentations, has said he witnessed senior officials in the intelligence community who expressed concerns about the surveillance program. The FBI then raided their houses, and Snowden viewed that as a punishment or a harassment to keep them quiet instead of expressing an opinion. So he believed that his avenues to the world were completely closed down. He had no superiors to talk to. And he would face retaliation. As a matter of fact, what it presented in the movie was that he was a target of investigation. And so he believed that he had no, no path. A lot of people can take that position. Does it happen? Sure it happens. If you operate the system incorrectly, people are going to come and investigate you. If I walk in right now and begin talking to the uh, base commander at Luke Air Force Base, they're going to be investigating me to find out why I'm there, where I came from, what I know, what I don't know, what my basis is, what my public exposure is, what my previous um, comments on a particular subject were, and they're going to find out if I am a rational source or not. Did Edward Snowden witness uh, some of these things? Maybe. I don't know. I wasn't there. On my programs, and there have been a lot of them, I have been the one going forward with a concern, Cambodia bombings, and I have been the one people came to with concerns. And I never raided their homes and I never investigated them. Okay, I never shattered their careers. Um, so does that happen? I'm sure it does. Are there avenues available where that won't happen? Yes, there are. But when you go up to Congress and say, this is wrong, this is wrong, I saw this, I know this, I did this, I did this, they are going to check you out. Whenever I renewed or got a different security clearance, my friends would, it got to be routine. My friends would call and say, well, they were here again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. My wife would get to the point of just, oh, come on in, guys. You want coffee? What do you want? Okay, Because they're investigating you. They're investigating. I've taken uh, counterintelligence polygraphs. I've done um, lifestyle polygraphs. I've had friends from uh, junior college contacted. Okay. People are investigating you all the time. That's the deal going into this business. People are going to investigate you. Don't get all upset about that. It's a system. It's different than high school, college, university, whatever. The system is different. You're in the very deep water now. You're working with international intelligence agencies. You're dealing with five countries and their intelligence agencies uh, for a common cause. They're going to investigate you. We investigate everybody. That's the game. It's like playing football. Yeah, you, you decide I'm an NFL player, suit up. People are going to tackle you. You're going to get hit. It's going to be hard. You'll probably be injured. That's the game. Don't want that? Take the helmet off, scrub up, and go be a bus driver. Do whatever you want to do. You don't have to be in this game. 
So Snowden believed that the surveillance programs related to the Patriot Act were violating the Constitution, specifically the Fourth Amendment, which is the protection from illegal search and seizure. Mm -hmm. And so it was injustice, mm. and it was illegal, and he took it upon himself to tell us about this great secret. And he swore he would not do that. Where does, where does, where does the law come from? U.S. constitutional rights, where does that come from? Where does the law come from? So the Fourth Amendment we're talking about, right? Uh, well, the Fourth Amendment and all of the, all of the subordinate acts, laws, regulations so, yeah. that are attendant to it, where do they come from? So it came from where Congress was tried in the courts. Okay, and? And enforced by the executive agencies. So. Okay, uh, the Justice Department. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, so he... he so it came from Congress. Go to Congress. Where'd you get that from? 95% of all of these laws are public laws. 5% of them are highly classified. Are we in a society now where your word means nothing? Are laws always optional? I'll obey those laws, but I won't obey these laws. These laws I object to, so I won't obey those laws. I want to drive on the opposite side of the road because I feel it's improper. I think England's got it right and we've got it wrong. So I'm going to disobey those laws. This one I'll pay attention to. Okay. A lot of people feel that they are morally right and they're doing the right thing. Okay, Snowden, he outed this evil program. Oh, Edward, what a guy, stand up guy. You did what you thought was right. So did the grand wizard of the KKK. This is right for the country. So do the skinheads. So do the sons of anarchy. They think they're doing the right thing for the people. So did Pol Pot. So did uh, Heil Hitler. We're going to do the right thing. These gypsies are horrible people. Let's exterminate them. It's for the betterment of society. But sir, there are laws against that. We know what's right. We know what's right. The laws that are before us were made wrong. We are indeed a society of laws. The entire nation is built only upon laws. Yes, it's the Federalist Papers. Yes, it became the Constitution. Yes, it became the Bill of Rights. Now we've got amendments, okay? We have all that, but there is nothing to this country except the expression of the Founding Fathers. Here is how a nation should be, and we are the longest surviving democratic republic ever on the planet. So because they got some things right. I want to take another question that's related to what you just brought up. Okay. So in Snowden's life and in his conversation that we witnessed was the, the idea that sometimes a job becomes criminal. So he gave the example of the Nuremberg trials. Right. Where the first round of trials condemned the senior leadership. The second round of trials was about the bureaucrats. It was the prison guards. It was the train drivers. Sure. And they knew what they were doing, but they were following orders. Yeah. Eichmann. Little Eichmanns. Yeah, little Eichmanns. They were, they were only doing it out of fear. I was just they, following orders. They were probably going to get shot if they didn't do they it. They would have been shot. And so they were following orders against every moral code that they knew. And so Snowden thought, I am now disobeying the Constitution of the United States, the freedoms, the privacy issues. My job's illegal. I need to break my laws. Right. So the Germany reference, concentration camps, the German guards, okay, they had their weapons, they had their uniforms, and they had millions of, of people, okay. Did all of them only follow orders all the time? No. They snuck in what little food they could and got it to the prisoners when they could. Yeah, if they had said, this is absolutely wrong, they would have been shot on the spot and they knew it, okay. Did the Eichmanns of World War II, the Third Reich, that they lived, they lived under, if you resist, you'll be shot. I mean, on the spot, walking down the street, in the head, bam, 
They don't even pick up the body. They just march on. Under those conditions, could the people who said, this is wrong, could they go to their Congress? Could they go to their head of state? Could they go to the police? Could they go to anybody and seek remedy? They could not. At that point, they become imprisoned just like the prisoners they are guarding because if they don't do what they're told, they will be dead. Their families will be dead. And they'll be tossed on the pile of bodies and burned with the rest of them. Okay, so that's extreme. Okay, so Snowden is not living under a Nazi dictator. Well, he said similar to genocide similar. programs in World his, War II. His execution will be, uh, you will be terminated, you will be blacklisted, you might go to prison. And so he says, I'm going to just dump the information and run. I'm going to go to the Russians because I think I'll be safe there. And I don't believe I'll have a safe trial in America. I will never come back until they promise that they will listen to my side of the argument. Right, because he knows he's a traitor. He knows he violated his oath. He knows the Espionage Act of 1917. He knows what he did was foundationally wrong. He knows that what he did was counter to everything he ever promised. And somewhere in his dark little soul, he knows that he could have gone another way. And he, we say, well, he's not getting any money for this. He didn't sell this stuff. He's living in an apartment. He's got three hots and a cot, transportation, living in Russia. He's using the currency of stolen classified information just as if it were money because his life is being paid for. His whole existence is based on the value of the classified information he still trades in as currency. What do you think Russia's gonna do when the value of his currency is no longer enough to bother with? They're not gonna keep him in a nice apartment in Moscow and bring him food and give him internet and let him have his social sites and start up his little organizations that he starts up to find people who support his position and they publicize why they're good. They're not going to continue to support that. He is on a visa, it expires this year. So far he's gotten extensions because the value of his classified information is adequate. The value of his public figure is adequate. He makes the US look bad. He makes the US look untrustworthy. They like that. So they keep him around. When his value fades, He's going to be escorted off to a gulag somewhere and say, eat what you can find. He is trading in the only currency that he has. And when his value runs out, he won't be able to pay the rent and he'll get evicted. All right. Last argument. Why would we support Snowden? The answer is results matter. So he was successful. Mm -hmm. He caused the debate about surveillance to become so public that every ruler in the world from Obama and Merkel and everybody had to talk about it. Everyone in the street talked about it for a while. It's not so mm -hmm. much now. But he changed the behavior and principles. And now, even though it was a personal cost to himself, he accomplished his goal. Great. So the guy who was standing on the balcony with all of his little firearms and his bump stock and he opened fire on the concert and killed people, he raised the consciousness about gun control. He raised the consciousness about what do we do about traffic and firearms. He raised the uh, argument about how do you get weapons into a hotel and how come there's no checking. This is something that needs to be considered. Let's all talk about it for two and a half months and it's gone. So did he raise consciousness? Yes, but at what cost? At what cost? Did he change our behavior? Uh, do we no longer continue surveillance on a massive scale or is that just now not something we talk about and we still do it? I'll refer you to um, anything in the press about surveillance that we do currently. I, I don't know what it says in the press. Tell me, tell me what's in the press. The U.S. is, is continually engaged in surveillance activities in accordance with international laws. 
So we have continued the process as it was. Before. I suppose. Yeah. I I don't know. So we're we have. I don't know these things. So the so the argument. I forgot. His results were short term. Uh, his results were nil, and they were noise. They were noise in social media, in the press, on TV, around the world. Within the agencies, if I were guessing, I would guess they didn't have a significant impact. Reactions from you guys? Questions? Oh, um, inside the movie, and I know it's like politicized because it's medium stuff, but they show a spy that um, you, he found intel on something, and that's why I use that intel to try to get um, financial advantage over someone. So, like, um, the guy was rich, I think. I didn't really understand that part. But he had a daughter, and that daughter had a boyfriend, and that boyfriend was illegal, I guess, and deported. So then that daughter almost attempted to do suicide and then um, the spy decided to use that opportunity to try to say hey we could get that guy legal here like a visa and just pay us money or something but I, I don't really know. yeah so so the, the background was that there was a Saudi banker in the story and they believed that he was uh, dealing with dirty money with Al Qaeda what do you know? And, uh, and so, they, Shock. so they looked through his personal profile. They found that his daughter was dating an illegal immigrant. They arrested the illegal immigrant. And then they said, ah, now you have a personal problem that we can fix. So they could grant him citizenship, make the banker feel like he's indebted to them. And then now they have a, a cooperative witness against Al-Qaeda's money laundering. And so they put a girl in danger. She nearly committed suicide. They put a guy behind the wheel as drunk and put these people in personal situations that were dangerous and they used it to twist it on them to get what they wanted from hmm. the Saudi banker. Find the pressure point and push it is what he said. That is part of tradecraft um, within certain segments of agencies similar to CIA. And Many times, especially from the outside, they seem very unfair, very unpleasant, very mean, um, and that is true. Those are reviewed by Director of National Intelligence constantly. And in theory, they are within the limits that are necessary to ensure that certain operations continue and we gather information that we can use to thwart enemies okay i didn't spend a lot of time in operations of that level because it ain't my thing i'm a i'm a tech person there are people who do that job former seal special forces Blackwater, those guys. Uh, do I agree with everything that they do and how they, how they do it? No. Have I raised that concern? Yes. Have I raised that concern way up through the government? Uh-huh. Okay. And at that point, I have to, I have to leave it, but I do know that a lot of that operational methodology is well known uh, within the general public. Is all of it accurate? No. Is some of it accurate? Some of it is. Okay. Is it a monstrously unpleasant component? Yes, it is. And the unfortunate reality is we are all highly civilized people. We are high thinkers. We are in the university. We are expanding our minds. That's great. That is the type of society we are in. That's where we live. Unfortunately, many parts of the world, political incorrectness, uh, I'm sure, there are still a lot of folks who are basically barbarians. Okay, 
they're going to raid your village. They're going to burn your women. They're going to burn your village. They're going to mutilate people. They're going to do that so that they can take over your rice field. Okay? They are not going to come and sit at these tables and have intellectual exchanges and look at things from all sides. They're going to pick up whatever weapon they can and they're going to conquer what's in front of them. That's the unfortunate reality. Do we have to deal on that level? Yes, from time to time we do. Okay. We have folks who are planted in, in outlaw biker gangs. We have folks that are, are planted in tribes in the mountains of the Middle East. Okay. They do things vastly differently to us in this room, in this society, from our families. It is barbaric, it is repugnant, it is evil, it is horrible, it is their normal. And if you want to affect change within their normal, if you want them to not attack more villages, you have to operate within their normal. Okay. I don't, I don't like to drive a flaming bus full of explosives, but if I have to, that's gonna be my operating environment. It is not pleasant. It's terribly dangerous. It's horrific. People can be killed. It's not my operational environment, but if that's the environment I must enter to do a greater good, then I will. Okay, I don't choose to. But I did, I did stay out of that. I worked with those folks. We got them information. We got them satellite imagery. We got them technology. We allowed them to be able to have situational awareness, to communicate with one another, to communicate back to the world. Okay. We provided the technology. Um, but I didn't go on the ground and cut off people's fingers and things like that. Okay. Sorry. I've got another one that I think we've talked about in a personal conversation. It's about the idea of nuclear war. Mm -hmm. So nuclear weapons have been around and have been a moral question ever since the first bomb exploded. Mm -hmm. So the Rosenbergs mm -hmm. famously said the United States cannot be trusted to be the only nuclear superpower and we are going to help Russia develop their bomb. Mm -hmm. Which they did. In another sense, in your B-52 experience, it's a nuclear weapon launching vehicle. What kind of exposure could you have done to say, I don't believe in nuclear war, I'm going to out certain information, and what would it have been and what, what could it have done? Well, when we were, when we were doing Nixon's private war, uh, we were not dropping nuclear devices, we were dropping 500 bomb <coughs> conventional bombs. Um, but B-52s are meant to carry nukes. B-52s are able to carry nukes. Depends on the, you, you change the configuration yeah. for it to do that job. So the fact that you have nuclear weapons, I worked on Minuteman, I worked on several other platforms that carried nuclear warheads. We launched 10 missiles. Each missile had 10 nuclear warheads. They were independently steerable. Okay, we still have those. I worked on space-based weapons, kinetic and uh, laser. Okay, anti-satellite, anti-missile, any personnel, space-based weapons that have been taken down because of the Star Wars Treaty. Okay, they were too powerful. So I don't, I don't want to get into the subject of nuclear war, but my, sub, my, my question was, did you possess any kind of uh, materials in your job in the, the, uh, the field of you know, the bombers that you could have shared as a protest against? Oh, absolutely. I had the launch codes. War. You had launch codes to what? I had the, to the Miniman missile system. Okay. I had 10 silos of 10 missiles. I had the launch codes and I have both launch keys, the physical keys. Okay. I knew exactly how they worked. I knew exactly how to launch them. Did I ever, I never considered sharing it for any reason. Are you for nuclear war then? I'm not for any war. I'm not for nuclear war. Nuclear war is a result of a technology that we developed and now we're responsible for. Are you against nuclear war? I am against pretty much all war. Okay. So then why don't you share those launch codes? 
because I stuck my little mitt up in the air and I said, I promise not to divulge classified information. I promise, and I stand on my promise. Okay, well, let's, let's stop here. We've gotten ourselves two uh, vastly different points of view. So Tuesday we watched the movie that says Snowden was a hero of conscience. He did exactly what he should have, even though it cost him personally a lot. And then we've heard the story here from somebody that's been in the CIA that says he's a traitor and he violated many different processes and he has not done the public any good. So in our assignments, I have for you the evaluation. At the beginning of this process, I had you do a survey on some of these questions about personal privacy, about government surveillance, about constitutional rights. Now that you've seen this, go back to that same assignment, and at the last page, you'll see the exact same survey. After you've watched the arguments and you've heard the sides, tell me if your views have changed one way or the other. So I'm not going to grade you on if you came up with the right answer. I'm going to came up with the way had you analyzed the answer and thought about the consequences of it. 